Life is so much easier with a great sense of humor. No one ever said it had to be rated PG. Sometimes it feels good to let out our inner smartass and drop a few F-bombs. Smartass and Sass is a subscription box where you can get your fix of brazen humor each month. Smartass and Sass items are curated and personally tested by the SNS team, a group of really mouthy mofos who want you to get a good laugh in your day. Each box consists of one Smart Ass and Sass t-shirt and between seven and nine trendy and snarky items, and it's valued at over $90. We just got our boxes Mm -hmm. and got some reusable food bags. I got, it's all very useful. I got some makeup Mm -hmm. brushes. I got some little ramekins. (laughs) There's three. One says you've, one says been, one says poisoned, and I'm very much looking forward to to serving my children and out of these. They can't read, so it's fine. It's great. I also got some bookmarks, which are useful, because I've been using junk mail as bookmarks, and that's not good. I need to shred the junk mail, and now it just says, I like big books, and I cannot lie. (laughs) Uh, So it's fantastic. (laughs) Well, use code CREEPY for 15% off your first-time subscription and shop orders. They cannot be combined with any other offer, and it's a one-time use only. Follow Smart Ass and Sass on social media for your daily dose of attitude. The past two years have made us all feel a little isolated, but this man took the concept of solitude to another level. 27 years in the woods alone, and he never once sought out human contact. He sought out other things, though. Books, food, clothes, tools, and anything else he could get his hands on. Was he an unrepentant criminal or just a guy trying to make it on his own? This week's episode is The North Pond Hermit, Christopher Thomas Knight. In the night, your heart fills with dread Probably a murderer who wants you dead It could be a ghost, a demon, or worse Perhaps you're the victim of a witch's curse It's hopeless, you're doomed, you'd call a priest if you could You'd rather just listen to who? Sinister How long could you go without human interaction before cracking? I talk to myself so much. I could probably go for a really long time. I talk to myself all. Paris talks to himself and I talk to myself. It's very confusing when two people live in the same place. I talk to myself so much that Tommy doesn't know anymore if I'm talking to myself (laughs) or to him. So if we're in the same room and I'm talking to him... He just won't answer, and I'll keep talking, and he won't, and I'll finally go, babe, do you hear me? And he's like, what? I thought you were talking to yourself. And I'm like, no, I'm talking to you. He's you like, well, you talk him. to yourself so much that I don't know when you're talking to me and when you're not. So now I have to tell him, hi, I'm talking to you. I need an answer, please. <laughs> but And sometimes he'll be like, what? And I'm like, nothing. I'm talking to myself. So it is very confusing, but mm-hmm. I, I also talk to myself a lot. But I was thinking last night. What would be my cutoff time before I started going real stir crazy? And I think it's a month. Yeah, probably a month. I also like human interact. Like I like hugging, even if I don't have to talk to somebody. I like to be hugged. Mm-hmm. Paris knows I like love to be like, put your arm around me, hold my hand, rub my back, scratch my head. So I'm like a cat. I'm very needy. <laughs> so <laughs> I think I would probably after about a month probably start to get like, I need to rub up against somebody. But like a cat, you also like your solitude. So it's true. You and I like to cat. take like to take naps in the sunshine. Everything. <laughs> yes. And cat-ish. you're more active at night. Yeah. This is why I can't have a pet cat because I am a cat. Yeah. Yeah. I don't. Yeah. It'll try and fight you for uh, <laughs> dominance. dominance in the house. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I this... definitely couldn't go 27 years. No, probably not. Not even with like a small amount of television or radio. Mm-hmm. Or books. I know it sounds great, but I think I do need to, at at the very least, if I'm watching something, go, can you fucking believe this? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the other, I said, I what show was it I wanted to watch the other night? And Tommy said, goes. Cheer, right? You said you were trying to get Tommy to watch Cheer? He is why I've now finished it, and I told him, I need someone to watch this, because I got a lot of hot <laughs> takes, and I need to talk about it. And so he's now trying to catch up. But there was something else the other day that we were going to watch We've been watching it together, and then... Was it Station Eleven? It may have been Station Eleven. Oh, so good. We finished it. We're also now watching 
archive eighty one at oh, okay. your friend Gypsy's request or suggestion, not request. Um, maybe it was that, and he goes, "Well, you can keep watching it because he wanted to go to bed." And I was like, "Who am I going to make comments to then? <laughs> I can't watch this by myself. Oh, I got to make comments t- to people." Yes, you got to do it together. So yeah, it does yep, make it better. So twenty seven years, I can't, but some can, and this man sure wanted to, and, and would have kept doing yes. it had he not been caught. I think so. I think getting get, the whole getting caught was like technology. It was a matter of time. But like, man, I think he would have just into the Hepped abyss. It like, that's mm-hmm. it forever. Yeah. And he was happy. I don't think he ever was like, it was like, did you miss people? No, I'm no, good. he he did not care for social relationships. He didn't miss them. He didn't long for them. He he was happy and felt fulfilled on his own out in the wilderness. The. The hiccup in his plan is, um, if that's the life you want to live, go for it. But you gotta do it on your own. You can't. <laughs> you can't Better expect be a everybody else to support that and steal from them in order to be able to live that way. That's you know, not fair. You piss people off a little bit. Doing yeah, that. just this, a little. Uh, I'll say this is one of the ones that I have been so interested in, and mm-hmm. I binged the whole book, um, Stranger in the Woods, which we'll link in the show notes. Highly recommend it. It's an excellent piece of uh, – I love nonfiction creative writing, and this was, like, right up my alley. Mm-hmm. It's, a very, it's very interesting because this is one of those things that nothing tragic happened. There's, I mean, yes, a crime was committed, but it's not heinous. No one died. He's alive and well. So you can – research and read all of this with kind of a more relaxed attitude than we do a lot of things, but it's Uh still so fascinating because it's hard to wrap your brain around that someone chooses to live this way. I feel like I want every single detail of what, you know, like I can't get enough photos. I can't, this book I've gone back. I had the audio book and I got the Kindle so I could go back and reread parts Mm -hmm. because it was just so, it's so enthralling. I was just, I'm Every single detail, it, it gets me. And we didn't know about it until it was suggested. By uh, Dana Rhodes. Uh, mm-hmm. Put it in on our form on SinisterHead.com. There's a the little button at the bottom that says suggest a topic. And that is the best way to suggest topics to us because it's all very organized. And so we were looking for something for our Getting Into It Patreon uh, subscribers to vote on. They get to choose a topic, one of our main feed topics for the month. And uh, we had this one and some other pretty wild ones from the the form submission that we may end up doing some of those as well Mm because they're also very fascinating. But this was the one by uh, a landslide that the uh, Patreon subscribers at Getting Into It wanted to hear. So for, for everyone Thank for you for everyone. voting on it, and thank you, Dana, for sending it in. Because, like I said, now I found one of my new favorite uh, creative nonfiction books. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, I'm Christy. I'm Heather. And let's get into it. Rome, Maine is a small town in Kennebec County with a population of just over 1,000. Described as heaven on earth by some visitors, Rome's location in the Belgrade Lakes region makes it an ideal place for fishing, sailing, and swimming. Rome is also home to the Pine Tree Summer Camp, a place for children and adults with disabilities to participate in all the recreational activities Maine has to offer. When are we getting a Maine summer house? Dude, tomorrow. That's Yesterday stupid. we should have. My brother's girlfriend, Riley, is from Maine, from an island in Maine. And every time I see pictures of where she grew up and her parents still live there, it's just unbelievable. It's so gorgeous. Seeing pictures of where he, this man lived for so long and the rivers and that are people are canoeing on and kayaking on. I'm like, if that's your backyard, yeah. why would you ever leave the the winters? I guess yeah. you'd leave in the winter because that's, that's something that we, we as Texans do not understand how to deal with. No, I cannot. Surrounding the area are several privately owned cabins where folks from other parts of the state and around the country come to spend their summers. A handful of them live in Rome year-round, withstanding the region's brutal winters that see temperatures drop down to 20 degrees below zero Fahrenheit. One time I was in Chicago, and that was the wind chill, and it was bitter, and I decided that day I would go to law school in Dallas. (laughs) That day, (laughs) on the the Roosevelt Red Line stop, I'm telling you, I was like, this is, fuck this noise. Yeah, my brother went to college in Chicago, and he said, I never knew a cold like that until I lived there, and he was... 
so over it by the time he graduated that he moved to LA. So everyone, if you're not <laughs> meant for that weather, you eventually have a breaking point where you're like, I gotta get to the hottest place on the planet. I can't do it. Mm-hmm. Aside from their love of the beautiful landscape and the friendliness of their neighbors, for decades, the people of Rome had one more thing in common. Their fear of the legendary creature they came to refer to as the North Pond Hermit. Kids would share stories in class of the hermit's visit to their homes. Teens in the early 90s were told about a ghost that took things from cabins around the region. When adults got back to Rome each summer to begin the season, they compared notes on what all went missing from each of their camps. Cabin after cabin found itself struck by a sneaky burglar with a very specific set of preferences. Pine Tree Camp was hit repeatedly, with snacks, cereal, meat, and peanut butter crackers stolen from its pantries and freezers, and tools missing from its grounds. Yeah, it would be like, you can't... You think, okay, I I must have I must have moved that. You're but gaslit. Then, you feel like you're being gaslit. That's what they said that one of the houses everything was bolted shut, but that a faucet was broken in the kitchen and it had been set back down and they noticed that the dust on the windowsill had been must like Disturbed. messed with and that they said, okay, well, obviously somebody unhooked the kitchen window, snuck in, stepped on our faucet and broke it, and then just set it back and then went back out the way they came. But if you didn't notice that dust, you mm-hmm. would just lose your mind. You'd be like, who broke this fucking faucet? Yeah. Families turning on families. And and nothing, like, your TV's still there. Yeah. So you're like, well, if somebody broke in, they would have taken this, right? But, yeah, yeah it's... Uh... But where are all the fucking batteries? Yeah. <laughs> You'd be like, can I get a flashlight up in this bitch? Where's Mm -mm. all my stuff? There was never any broken glass at the scene of the crimes. According to police, some families would even wonder if they had actually been burglarized or if they had just misplaced items on their own. Things like big screen TVs, CD players, and expensive jewelry would remain in place. Stranger items like batteries, propane tanks, cans of tuna fish, and entire sacks of leftover Halloween candy would be missing instead. The burglar also stole magazine and books, sci-fi novels, Stephen King tomes, even romance novels, according to reports. Closets were raided, and the hermit took pants, shirts, jackets, hats, gloves, belts, and even underwear. One cabin lost a mattress. Another lost a set of sheets and some pillows. Tents, tools, and rakes would disappear, never to be seen again. There was one family that their door was boarded up, or not boarded up, it was like bolted shut when they, you know, they had unbolted it, but an entire twin size mattress was gone out of the back bedroom. And then they looked around the edge of the door where the pins go in the other side of the door opposite, you know, where the hinges are. And they figured out, okay, somebody took the hinges off the door, slid the mattress out, and then put the hinges back on the door and put the door back together. So it was very sneaky stuff like that. But also... He was considerate in the fact that he was taking what he believed he needed. I'm not Mm -hmm. justifying it or saying it's correct. But then he didn't want others to break into their Mm -hmm. home while they were gone. So he put everything back and would, like, relock the doors and relock the windows and, you know, try and make it look like he didn't break the faucet. So there was a sense of... I know what I'm doing is wrong and I feel guilt about this, but I still need these things to survive. Yet I am not going to go out and work for them myself to maintain the lifestyle that I want. Well, and also not taking the easy way. I mean, you just take a hammer and bust the glass out. Mm -hmm. I think for a few years, you know, from the early 80s, probably to the mid 90s, people still weren't locking their doors until it started being like, you lost stuff. They said there was a community meeting of like 100 people and they said, hey, everybody here, raise your hand that's been hit by the hermit and like 75 people raise their hand. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's just like, that's a small sample size. Although in a town of a thousand, is it? Is that a very small sample size? That's the most people. Yeah, everybody knew that. But they also said when they set out, you know, food or whatever that it was always the packaged food that got stolen it wasn't mm-hmm. like hey i'm gonna put some rat poison in this bunt cake and see if he takes it <laughs> yeah well that's a monster i hope that no <laughs> one would do that <laughs> not cool the police tossed her on theories on who the culprit or culprits might be according to mike finkel author of the stranger in the woods they speculated that it could be a band of teenagers some sort of gang initiation or even neighbors targeting neighbors Incidents continued multiple times per year from the late 1980s up until the early 2010s. 
That's a hell of a gang initiation if that's what you're doing <laughs> to get in one of those main gangs. <laughs> you said the main gang is a 20 year initiation. Well, they were saying that's why they thought it might be teenagers because they would be like, oh, it's not the same teenager every year. It's like, okay, I did it last year. Now you uh, do it this year. Yeah. So, like, there's no way one person is burgling for 20 years. Well, joke's on you. <laughs> After over 25 years of repeated burglaries, the hermit had the people of Rome on edge, wondering if their house would be hit next. Though he never hit homes with anyone inside them and never hit year-round residents, folks still felt a chill of uneasiness. Someone had been inside their homes, touching their things. And that's what a couple of people had said. Either they lived there year round and said, we've never been hit. It's totally weird. Or some folks that had cabins said, OK, I'm going to stay and I'm going to sit in my cabin in a chair with a gun. And I'm going to turn all the lights off and wait. And then when he comes, I'm going to confront him. Well, it's almost as if the hermit could see people going in and out of their <laughs> yeah. houses and would be like, oh, not the one with the guy sitting mm-hmm. in the rocking chair with a pistol in it. No, that's the one I'm not going to go in. He would watch the homes to see. Mm-hmm. Who was there? I mean, he, he did not like from what I've been told and uh, from watching all of my crime shows, most burglars don't want to encounter a person mm-hmm. at home. So they want to hit a house that isn't there. And then when you couple that with someone who is terrified of human interaction and goes to great lengths to avoid it, he is going to make sure that no one is there when he breaks into their house. Oh, for sure. And I, I think, yeah, it was never like, I'm going to go in and attack these people. It was, no. I'm going to slip in when no one sees me, and then I'm going to mm-hmm. take what I need to take. But it is sad when you think about it. It's a town of a 1,000 people. That's such a small micro community. Everybody knows everybody that you do start to go, well, could it be the guy across the street? Mm-hmm. Or, hey, that new family that moved in. Or what about, you know, like you start to, it almost is, a really insidious way to tear a community apart because it's so many people feeling that sense of I've been violated mm-hmm. that you just want an answer. And it's in this case was very a, a difficult answer to get that you start to go like, well, maybe it is those damn teenagers or maybe it is those out of towners for the summer. or You know what I mean? So mm-hmm. it's like you think you know your neighbors and then you also feel like, oh, it's only a thousand people. I know everybody. I'll just leave my windows unlocked like it's the 1950s. So it's another sad case. You know, it's a sad consequence that you had this kind of relaxed community that now – Damn it, we're just like every other city. Yeah, Yeah, we have to walk our doors. Like, we might as well live in the fucking city. (laughs) It sounds like the plot to an M. Night Shyamalan movie. Ooh. Like this, like like you said, like everyone turns on each other in this small town because they think someone amongst them is doing something when the reality is someone is amongst them, but it's not who they think it is. But I've had two, two different cars, I think a total of three times broken into. And it is a very uneasy feeling to know that someone has been in your stuff, rummaging through your things. It's that's where you feel safe and most and it's personal, like your car, your house. So to know someone's been there when you're gone, even if they didn't take anything of a ton of value, it's scary to think it's creepy. Yeah, it's very creepy. It's unsettling. Well, when, like whenever I was looking, I was texting you slash best fiending on my phone, and I saw that guy in my ring doorbell or oh my, my God, ring camera that in the was back. So scary! At like one o'clock in the morning, trying to pull my ring camera off, and then I had to yell at him, and then I faked. <laughs> like <laughs> Heather did a voiceover. <laughs> I did a voiceover. I went, "What are you doing? What the no, fuck are you doing?" No, this is how it went. First of all, the you were you showed me the video like almost in real time, and he. It's a thing we found out in next door. People still ring doorbells because it's not attached to your technology anymore after that. So they can just resell them. Well, Heather goes, what are you doing? And the guy like startles and she goes, what the fuck are you doing? And he just turns around and walks off. And, she- and I said, <laughs> and then Heather goes, babe, get the gun. And then she <laughs> pretended to be Harris and goes, I'm coming. <laughs> It's it like wonderful. so embarrassing. <laughs> um, you know what? He went away time, though. He did. I heard him go, "Oh shit, oh shit," because I think somebody oh, else was did? with him. Yeah, and then I called the police, and then they came like an hour later, 
And I showed them the video, and I cut it off before I yelled, babe, get the gun. Oh, you should have left that. They would have loved it. Embarrassing. Four (laughs) Dallas police officers are like, lady, really? Uh, No. Because then they'd be like, do you have a gun? And I'd be like, no. Um, Or do I? Uh, But that's how you get... That's how things like that happen, is you do something stupid, like steal the wrong person's ring doorbell, and they do have a gun, and they do... They are coming, and you know? It was just... I thought I was being scary. And Paris was like, what are you doing right now? And I was like, I don't know. And then we sent Buffy out there, who, of course, is like, I mean, she was barking, and she's got a very scary bark. And she kind of was patrolling up and down the back of the fence. But it was very, that was the back perimeter of my house. Mm -hmm. You know, I have an eight-foot fence or however tall. Yeah, probably an eight-foot fence. That, like, that's still, and, you know, it's locked and everything. But it's still so, like violating that someone mm-hmm. touched it they were pulling you know he was pulling on it jokes on him paris broke the plastic attachment off a long time ago so it is straight up metal drilled into the fence so you cannot pull it off <laughs> i'm like Haha, someone's already That's been why it here took him so long this is my clumsy ass fiance <laughs> was trying to readjust it and snap that bitch off and i was like really now i have to like rig this with like a metal clamp well turns out <laughs> it's the reason why he, they didn't he was steal doing it. you a favor but yeah, mm-hmm. something like that. Just even, even though they didn't even steal the thing, especially having the having his face on camera and seeing, mm-hmm. like, knowing that there is a person that's within that many feet of you that's touched your things, yeah. and it just it gives you that like uneasy. It was I couldn't go to sleep that night, mm-hmm. which yeah, was like sure. not trying to be dramatic, but you know your adrenaline's up and you're like someone's around. So I mm-hmm. can't imagine like every year for 27 years you're like, am I? Is this going to be the year they're they're going to hit me? Yeah, or you you know that well, we're going to go back for the summer. I wonder what's gone this time. You know, it's, you have summer homes, I imagine. I don't have a summer home. I would Mute. love one. <laughs> I'd love a home for every season. But I imagine you go as a place to relax and unwind. And if this is what's going on, it's the opposite of what you're trying to do. Yeah, I knew a friend in college. They had a summer home in Green Lake, Wisconsin. N- very fabulous. Nice. Green Lake, Wisconsin. But they left, you know, you'd leave a bunch of stuff up there. You leave board games and mm-hmm. blankets and because you're not going to like, okay, every year we're going to clean the whole house out. No, you wouldn't have so. to law. Yeah, haul all that shit up there. No, be a huge fan, yeah. So, you know, you just go, well, I guess whatever, whatever they take, it's fine. Mm-hmm. Locals adapted in various ways. Some installed burglar alarms and security systems, though these never seemed to work. Others would board their windows and doors shut for the winter which seemed to ward off any intruders. Some residents even set out offerings for the hermit, leaving books or sacks of candy on their doorknobs. He never took them, instead preferring to slip in through windows in the darkness and take what he needed. Yeah, they would also put little notes on their door that said, hey, hermit, write a list of what you need and I'll have it out here for you tomorrow, which is so thoughtful. (laughs) It is, and it's also, I would rather do that than you break in and go through my stuff what I don't get is why he didn't take people up on that. I wonder if he thought, well, A, that is technically human interaction, but also I wonder if he was worried it was a trap. Perhaps, as it, or if he left behind some his handwriting or something he could be incriminated or found out, yeah. Or traced or something. Or if, you know, you reach out to get the bag of candy and it, like, locks your hand in and then they get you, you know. Because <laughs> yeah. you technically have burgled, uh, I mean, at some point, 40 houses a year times 20-some-odd years that you are a wanted person. So mm-hmm. you would be like, I'm not going to be lured to a... That's how the FBI used to get the mafiosos. They tell them that they want a boat. So yeah. it's like, hey, Hermit, we got you a sack of candy. And you go show up for the candy, and then the game is over. That's how I get caught. <laughs> hey, sack of candy. we've got a, a bag of Cheetos and some Kit Kats, and then next thing I know, I'm in jail because I, uh, I fell Box a bunch it. of crunch. Get me a human... Man, I need to try some bunch of crunch because I need to apparently shout out that's Christy. the candy of everyone's dreams that I have been missing out on. You crushed it. Christy threw me a bridal shower this weekend, side note. And uh, it was the bridal shower of my dreams. Like I said, I couldn't have even dreamed it. And it was like movie themed at Alamo Draft House, which is one of the places where Paris and I had our first dates. And she had movie candy out. And my favorite movie candy is Bunch of Crunch. I didn't know it. We were at Target, Tommy and I. Shout out to Tommy because he was... Such a trooper and such a helper, helping me plan everything. I could not have done it without him. We were at Target buying all because the, they have a movie candy section. It's just the Hell box yeah. candy. And he goes, "Get all that bunch of crunch." I go, "What is that?" He's like, "What do you mean? What is that?" I go, "I've never <laughs> had those." He's like, "Everybody loves these." I go, "I've never known anyone that's eaten these." 
if I was at a movie, this is exactly what I would want. I go, okay, I'll get them. And then they were the first things to go. And mm-hmm. like four people there were like, oh, you got bunch of crunch. These are my favorite. Still haven't had it. I didn't get to try them. They went so fast. <laughs> I, gotta try I got them. one. I definitely got one whole box. I'm, I don't think I took the other one because Hannah Vaughn at the same time was going up there and we were like, you getting Bunch of Crunch? She was like, yeah, I'm getting Bunch of Crunch. Of course I'm getting Bunch of Crunch. <laughs> well, I'm glad you had a good time. It was fun to plan. And I. it was uh, your mom and sister, shout out to them too, helping me in that 30 minute time frame to set up. Was, <laughs> 30 minutes or less. Ooh, yeah. It Crushed was a, it. a dash to the finish line. And, uh, you know, 30 minutes or less, it took us 45, but we, we got it done. <laughs> Over and over, the hermit hit the pine tree camp, stealing food and supplies from the nonprofit organization. Cameras inside the camp didn't deter him. When the camp leadership caught the hermit on camera, he appeared as a well-groomed, nicely dressed, middle-aged man in glasses, digging through their chips, eating them, then putting them back. He was seen rummaging through their freezer, filling up a sack he brought with him, and slipping out a front door. With his image captured, they thought for sure he would be identified, but they had no luck. Instead, hoping to scare the hermit, they framed a still shot from the surveillance footage and left it for him to see. This didn't deter him either, as the hermit struck the campsite yet again. They straight up printed it out and just put it on a frame like, we see you. And And he said, I don't give a fuck. Here, this is, stealing from anyone is wrong. Yeah. Stealing from a camp that is for children and adults with disabilities is especially wrong. Yeah, I think that's where the community was like, listen, you want to steal my bunch of crunch, that's fine. Right. But going in the summer camp, pulling a bag of chips out, eating it, and putting it back. I think it was chips, and I think he also did it with cereal. There's a documentary that was made by Lena Friedrich, and she interviews one of the women that's like in leadership at the camp and just said, she goes, yeah, we'd come back and we'd be like, oh, okay, he took the peanut butter, he took the crackers. And she said, then we got the surveillance camera. And then I watched him and he took the box out and he stuck his hand in it and ate it. And then he stuck his hand in it again. And then he closed up the box and he put it back in the pantry. And that's when I was like, oh, man. Just <laughs> take the whole box. That's what I'm saying. Take that shit. Don't, Dude. We don't know where your hands have been. No. Come on. And these shitting are kids. in the woods. Come on. What? You, yeah, yes. you're shitting in the woods. You're not bathing for weeks Mm-mm. at a time. Like, don't do that to people. Mm-mm. Don't be putting your hand back in the, the Chex Mix. Come on no. now. Nasty. Sinister Hood will be right back. Most of you have probably heard us singing the praises of Pros, the world's most personalized hair care. And for those that haven't, we want to tell you about the incredible results we're seeing using our customized Pros products. I got a ton of compliments on my hair at the bridal shower because I, of course, took a lot of pictures. I had gotten a blowout, but the uh, gal doing my hair said, your hair is so soft and shiny. She's like, normally when hair, my hair is down past my back, like it's down in the middle of my back. I have mermaid hair right now. She's like, normally when hair is this long, it's crunchy. And she said, it's Mm. really dry. And she was like, what do you use? And I was like, Pros. Pros. Yes. I I have been taking the supplements to help Ooh. with my hair and it's more lustrous and mm-hmm. thicker. I can I can tell that there's less shedding. So I I need to go get a blowout so I can get some compliments. Also, I just <laughs> love getting blowouts. Oh, they amazing. are amazing. Well, pros knows there is more to you than just your hair type. Pros has given over one million consultations with their in depth hair quiz, which is how we both got started. We took a quiz, asked where we live, what our level activity was, our uh, eating habits, all that kind of stuff. And then it said, this is what we recommend for what you're trying to do. We got to pick our scents. Mm, love oh, the scent. Botanical. Oh, such a good one. Yeah. I love you it all. You change up the scents too, which is what mm-hmm. I like too. You're not stuck with one scent. They still give you the same formulation. Pros is the healthy hair regimen when your name all over it. Take your free in-depth hair consultation and get 15% off your first order today. Go to pros.com slash creepy. That's P-R-O-S-E dot com slash creepy for your free in-depth hair consultation and 15% off. Well, uh, I don't like to wear white for a lot of reasons, but one of the reasons is I used to have this pair of really cute white shorts. One time I was going on a date and shave my legs and when you pull them on I didn't realize that I had cut myself shaving mm. it had a little red on the leg and it's you just realize it too late mm-hmm. also 
that I feel like anytime I cut myself shaving, it does not heal for a million years. Like it just gets caught on jeans Mm -hmm. or, and it's just a forever, like, damn it. I made one wrong move with a shitty razor. And this is what happened to me. Those, those cuts hit different. They're, yeah, they're a different kind of pain. Anything on my knee, on my ankle, I get mm-hmm. that. Oh, it drives me bananas. But I actually have not had an issue like this, which is good. I'm wearing a lot of white, getting ready for the wedding with my Athena Club razor. No more cuts, no more bleeding. Athena Club's razor is designed with built-in skin guards to help prevent razor burn while being gentle on curves. The razor blade is surrounded by a water-activated serum with shea butter and hyaluronic acid, which is a holy grail for skin care. The best parts, the razor kit's only $9, comes with two blade heads, a magnetic hook for shower storage, and your choice of handle color. Also, you have got to try their cloud shave foam. I haven't used shave foam in so long, but this shave foam, it's like, it really is like shaving with the cloud. And mm-hmm. the other day, someone had moved it out of the shower, and I was yep. in the shower, and I didn't no. have it. And I was like, what? And then I could tell later that I hadn't used it. My skin didn't feel as good. Mm-mm. If you use soap, it's so different. When mm-hmm. you go Shh, in the in your hand, it goes whoop. It like pops up and makes mm-hmm. it all foamy. It's amazing. It's awesome. Show your skin you care with the Athena Club Razor Kit. Sign up today and you'll get 20% off your first order. Just go to athenaclub.com and use promo code SINISTER. That's A-T-H-E-N-A-C-L-U-B.com with promo code SINISTER for 20% off. Whoa, what was that? It is the last Olipop before my next order arrives because uh, Paris and I fight over who gets to drink these. And it is my favorite flavor, classic root beer. Classic root beer. That's Tommy's, too. Mm, You know who else likes it? Ella. And we don't let her have sodas, but we will let her try the Olipop because they're not just your traditional soda. Nope, Olipop is a new kind of soda. It tastes just like the sodas I grew up with, but unlike other sodas that are full of sugar, corn syrup, and artificial ingredients like aspartame, Olipop is made with natural ingredients that are actually good for you. It comes in delicious nostalgic flavors like vintage cola, classic root beer, orange squeeze, and my favorite, cherry vanilla. They use functional ingredients that combine the benefits of prebiotics, plant fiber, and botanicals to support your microbiome and benefit digestive health. Olipop is much, much lower in sugar than conventional sodas, with only 2 to 5 grams of sugar from natural sources. No added sugar. Receive 20% off plus free shipping on your order. I recommend trying their variety pack. It's a great way to try all of the delicious flavors, and then you can figure out which one you like best and order those. Go to drinkolipop.com slash creepy or use code creepy at checkout to claim this deal. That's D-R-I-N-K-O-L-I-P-O-P dot com slash creepy. Olipop can also be found in over 8,000 stores across the country, including Kroger, Target, Whole Foods, Sprouts, and Wegmans. Eventually, game warden Sergeant Terry Hughes found himself fed up. With the advent of highly sensitive motion sensor technology, he vowed to end this decades-long crime spree. Terry told the Portland Press-Herald that he borrowed some high-tech equipment from a friend who worked in Border Patrol. He set the sensor at the camp, then put the alert mechanism in his own home. Day or night, rain or shine, Terry was determined to catch the hermit. Uh, Sergeant Terry Hughes is a former Marine, has been a game warden for a couple decades, was like, not fucking around. He not put on this... my watch is <laughs> he this was happening. Like, Listen, what can I do? And his friends that was in Border Patrol was like, well, we got this thing and you can set it up. You can set the alert in your house. So he put it at the top of his stairs so that no matter if he was in his bedroom, kitchen, wherever he was, whatever floor of his house... Anytime he wanted to know that he was the determined. hermit was struck. Mm-hmm. And he lived like a mile from the place, so you can just Not hop even, in yeah. your car, get it, get right over there. On the night of April 4th, 2013, Terry got his chance. As he slept peacefully beside his wife, the motion detector's alarm sounded. In a later presentation at the Belgrade Public Library, Terry described how he leapt to his feet and sped over to the camp in less than five minutes. He approached the camp quietly and was able to spot the hermit before calling for backup. I mean, he set all of his stuff out, so he was like, the second that that alarm sounds, I'm going to grab... You know how you do, like, you practice? There's a mm-hmm. Dick Van Dyke show episode where Laura's going to go into labor, and so Rob practices, like, where his hat is? Where his bag? You know, you grab the hat, you grab the bag. Well, he forgot his uh, belt, you know, his... But he did remember his weapon, his service weapon, and flashlight and everything, but he had memorized getting into the camp so that he wouldn't set off because there were floodlights and motion sensors, much like the hermit had memorized it to avoid mm-hmm. all these motion sensors. Terry had memorized 
recognize it so that he wouldn't alert the hermit that he was there. So then he like crawls up, looks in the window, and there's the hermit sticking his damn hand in the cereal box again. <laughs> He's back. <laughs> But what a feeling for Terry! Oh. What you you you're, you found your it's your white whale. Yes. You finally got him. I gotcha. His wife's like, thank God, I cannot take this anymore. And I believe in the in a Stranger in the Woods, his wife woke up first. It was like, babe, the alarm's going off. Wake up, wake up. <laughs> God, behind every great hermit that's been caught is a great <laughs> wife who's just trying to get some sleep. <laughs> In The Stranger in the Woods, Terry shared that he couldn't wait for backup as he spotted the hermit trying to leave with a sack full of stolen items. In a flash, Terry blinded the hermit with his flashlight and trained his service gun on him, commanding him over and over to, Get on the ground! Get on the ground! The hermit complied. Soon, State Trooper Diane Vance, who had also been hunting the hermit for years, showed up with backup right behind her. The pair interviewed the hermit in the Pine Tree Dining Hall. Yeah, they had kind of worked with one another and known each other for several years and like, we're going to get him. This is the year we're going to do it. This was their passion project. He also, for his part, Christopher did not argue. He Mm -hmm. just, he knew, he was like, all right, okay, cool. He just, I mean, because again, he wasn't a violent person. Mm -mm. He didn't want to interact with humans at all. So I imagine you're completely caught off guard and you're like, Fuck, now I got to deal with people. But he wasn't the type of person to, like, put up a fire to try and run. Yeah, and that's what Terry said that he had, you know, kind of done a profile on him. And because he was so, the hermit was so careful about a lot of stuff, like I said, slipping into stuff and not leaving tracks when he left. And the strategy of, like, striking different houses, striking on nights when the moon was low so that the light was low outside, striking right before a rainstorm so then his footprints or anything would get washed away. Terry thought, okay well he may have military training Mm. so I don't know if he is violent and so that moment when Terry's on the porch of the dining hall because he sees the hermit start to he calls for backup he sees the hermit start to leave the dining hall you hear that click of that door handle like fuck he's about to Mm -hmm. I'm on the porch he's about to come we're about to be face to face you think this could be it like I don't know what I'm about to face luckily like you said he faced a person went okay Mm -hmm. sorry yeah, let me sit yeah, here. Yeah, but it could have been it could have been way Schrodinger's worse. Hermit up until that moment. <laughs> it was Schrodinger's <laughs> Hermit. <laughs> in their interview, authorities learned that the North Pond Hermit was Christopher Thomas Knight. Born December 7, 1965, in Kennebec County, Chris Knight was the fifth son born to his parents, with four older brothers and one younger sister. The family eked out a lower middle class existence in Maine making their home in a two-story colonial home on 55 acres of land. The Knights kept to themselves, preferring the company of each other. Indeed, one neighbor of the Knights said they never exchanged a word in the 14 years they lived next door to one another. Okay, let's not hate on people that don't know their neighbors, because some of us (laughs) don't know. Some of us don't get peach pies from our neighbors. Some of us. I get, we have fantastic neighbors. Uh, When Simon and I were sick, they delivered not one, but two different flavors of homemade quiche. It's fucking so. rude. <laughs> it's rude. They were so good. I don't even know if Tommy got any. Like, I had just got, when we they first delivered them, I could not, I did not have my sense of taste or smell, which sucked. Ugh. And then the next day, I was like, oh, I think it's back. And then the next day, it like really was back. And it was the first thing I ate. And I devoured it. It was so freaking good. <laughs> Keisha Clock. Meanwhile, one of my neighbors called the cops on Paris, and the other one chucked a tennis ball at my window and knocked my screen off. So, (laughs) super duper. (laughs) Great. The family spent time together in the evenings reading poetry, teaching their kids hands-on skills like plumbing and automotive repair, and sprucing up their home. The nights were handy, and they buried drums of water beneath the ground, on top of which they built a greenhouse. The water provided natural insulation and heat, allowing the family to grow its own plants and vegetables year-round with no electricity. Chris later said that while he had no complaints about his parents or how he was raised, that his mother and father were not emotional or affectionate, and that they expected stoicism, according to Dr. Todd Grande. Oh, he says, yeah, they're not, he's like, we're not bleeding emotion all over each other. Well, okay. you know what that might lead to is not giving a shit about being around anybody for decades. Uh, my favorite is I was listening to Dr. Todd Grande and Paris walked by and goes, 
kind of not lit, not knowing he knew not what he was saying. Paris is like, what's this guy's voice? What is he like on NPR? He's so trying. I go, fuck you. And listen to Todd Grundy. <laughs> listen to Dr. Grundy. And then he listens to him. And of course he makes his very dry. If you don't know, he's a the YouTuber Arby's joke. I laughed out loud. <laughs> hilarious <laughs> and so he says things in a very his series on dog the bounty hunter wrecked me so fucking funny he's so dry that you don't even realize he's made a joke until like a beat later and yeah. then you're like oh god that was so good you don't know you've been zinged until you mm-hmm. feel the zung you're yeah. like oh damn it Todd <laughs> Grande. so good and of course then Paris goes what Oh my gosh! I'm like, yeah, he's hilarious. Listen, <laughs> he's maybe great. you'll learn something from Todd Grande. <laughs> I was watching him. Ella walked in. I paused it because she was talking to me, and she goes, "What's that?" And I go, "That's Doctor Todd Grande." And she goes, "Is he talking to you?" <laughs> <laughs> I went, "Well, kind of. He only. makes videos and puts them on YouTube, so he can talk to a lot of people." We need to we need to do a crossover with Doctor Todd Grande. Oh my I don't God. know his love it and our oh yeah. It'd be, be wild. it'd be, uh, uh, yeah, the whole f- fucking thing, but I, I'm here for it. I would love it. Oh, obsessed. Growing up, Chris was a shy, quiet boy, but very smart. At Lawrence High School, he was known as a loner who didn't have many friends. Interacting with other humans was difficult and complicated for him, according to National Geographic. After graduation, he headed off to Waltham, Massachusetts, where he attended a technical school. Living far from home, he studied electronics and finished his studies over the course of nine months. He got a technical job installing burglar alarms and security systems after finishing his schooling. Bought himself a 1984 Subaru Brat using a loan he got with the aid of his older brother. Perhaps knowing a lot about burglar Mm -hmm. systems (laughs) uh, aided him well in his the next chapter of his life. Oh yeah, comes in very handy. Also, a Subaru Brat. Hilarious looking car. I don't know what it looks like. I should have looked it up, but hilarious name. Yeah. It's kind of, um, oh, uh, like a shorter El Camino because it has a back open to it and it's shorter oh. and stumpier. The ones I saw at least were. A stubby El Camino. I'm here stumpy. for it. I like yeah. that. It was in that Subaru that Chris took off out of Waltham. He headed south for sunny Florida, looking for a change of scenery. He made it to the Sunshine State before turning back and heading north. He drove toward Maine, where his parents still lived. After passing their home one last time, Chris drove toward a dirt road, equipped with a tent he had never used. He parked his car beside the road, its tank empty of gas. Chris left the keys to the Subaru on the dashboard and headed out into the Maine brush. According to The Atlantic, he wandered for about two years before finally setting up shop in his permanent home. The area he chose to lay down roots was called the Jarzy. Author Mike Finkel called the area. A Brillo pad the size of a football stadium. The terrain was unforgiving, making it difficult for even wildlife to traverse. Though the area Chris camped in was dense, it was not isolated. The nearest cabin was a mere three-minute walk from where he was, and his parents' home was just 30 miles away. He had changed campsites a few times over the course of his first two years, but once Chris found this area... He settled in and remained in the same spot for the next 25 years. Yeah, he took off out of uh, Massachusetts and just stayed in roadside motels. And then he said he got to Florida and said, well, I guess I'll go back home. And he drove all the way back up to Maine. And he said it was like a homing beacon that he just drove back to where his parents live, kind of the same area. And the last time he saw their house, he passed it in his car, didn't stop. (laughs) His family has a very different dynamic. Didn't roll yeah. down the window. Didn't stop. He just saw it. He said, I just kind of wanted to see it one last time. He drove and drove and drove. And he said he got to the end of the road and just thought, well, I guess I have to stop because there's no gas station. I mean, I'm going to stop one way or the other. And that he just bounced. He, Yeah. He had never used the tent. He had never even camped outside. Mm-mm. He... They, he slept outside in the back of a truck once, like they went hunting. Mm-hmm. His his dad would hunt, but that was pretty much it. It was baptism by fire. You go. He said, uh, "I'm I'm gonna learn how the hard way in one of the coldest places you could have to live outside." That's you know what? If go big or go home, and I he ain't so. going home, and he's not going home. He left the keys. Thirty miles down the road. Yeah, yeah, he left the keys. Um, and I think. I mean, the the first two years, like you said, he kind of wandered around and looked for different places. He cu- carved out a cave that was like in the side of a hill, but he thought, well, it's kind of an area where hunters go, so people might find. Plus, 
I didn't, I have no idea. I would die immediately, by the way, in this, because I don't know <laughs> yeah. anything. I was like, oh, you want to like lay on the ground? No, false. You don't want to lay on the ground. It makes you colder. Oh, so being yeah. in that cave actually made him a lot colder. So he abandoned it. Well, then by abandoning it, then he was right. Sometime later, some hunters found it and then local kids found it and it became this like, oh, that's the hermit's cave. The hermit mm. carved out the cave, which he had. He just didn't live in it because it was not ideal. And he, let me say, he gets quite a setup. I would also not bode well in the wilderness because I would think, oh, a cave, perfect. It is going to protect me from the elements. What I probably wouldn't notice is a family of bears sleeping in the back or, or something. <laughs> no, right. Or I didn't Scorpions. know that, like, yeah, I, I probably would also sleep on the ground. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't go well for me. No, I have no idea. He was very handy. All the stuff his parents had taught him was handy. He had some experience we'll hear so not experience but some at least um uh, academic knowledge of maybe mm-hmm. what to do in the situation and so i think that kind of engineering mindset of like oh well you just take it apart and do it this way i don't have that brain and i no. would die no yeah i don't i could not figure out how to put um a greenhouse in my backyard that doesn't require electricity and is just i live off the land i don't know how to do that yeah, the book they were explaining because water molecules are sticky and it absorbs heat. And I was like, what the fuck are you talking about? You buried a bunch of gallons of water. You put jugs make heat. What are you talking yeah, about? I don't it's know. It's a thing. That, Apparently yeah, it's I a thing. I guess so. Chris's family never reported him missing to the police. Without anyone actively looking for him, it made it easier to stay off the grid. Mike Finkel told National Geographic that when he asked local police if they found this odd, they replied... No, they're a very keep-to-themselves family. If a boy went off, then he went off. Finkel agreed, saying, They worried about him, I'm sure, but they didn't involve the authorities. That wasn't the ethos of that family. Yeah, they did not file a missing persons report. They didn't even alert the police. I don't know if the car was even returned to them. I mean, they Mm -mm. were just like, well, I guess that's what he's chosen to do. Yeah, he had some tools from work that he didn't return to the burglar company, and the burglar company called his family and said, hey, your boy bailed. He took the tools. What are you going to do about this? You owe us a couple hundred bucks. The family said, okay, and they paid it off. They didn't go, wait, what do you mean he left work and never came back? They went, okay, and they paid it off. The brother was pissed because the car, he had co-signed on the loan for the car, so he paid off the car loan because it was in his name. But they, to this day, haven't found the brat. There were people on Reddit that were saying they wanted to try to figure out where it may have been, but with the wilderness being so vast, and also he straight up did not remember. He purposefully got lost, Mm -hmm. so he, like, didn't remember where it was. But they said in 2001, his dad died, and in the obituary, they said he has survived by his sons, blah, 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 and Chris. So he was listed as a survivor in the 2001 obituary. Interesting. Um, But they said, So that makes me wonder, did he actually have some contact with them? I mean, he claims he didn't, but there are people that say, I don't buy it. Like, I think that he couldn't have made it out there in those, in that winter environment for that long. But it's, if he didn't have any contact with his family, it's interesting that they didn't assume he was dead. The brothers said that they did. They told they told him. They told others. Like, I mean, obviously he's dead. We haven't heard from him in 30 years. We would have heard from him. But that they said they told everybody and their mom, oh, he's out there somewhere because the mo- they didn't want to upset his mom. Mm-hmm. They didn't want to make her sad and upset her. So they just said, oh, yeah, you know, he's out there somewhere. And so that's why they listed him as a survivor. But I if. I think he may have, we'll, we'll talk about and what do we think, but I don't think he contacted his family because they were pretty surprised when they heard from him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think he did either. Because of its close proximity to other people, he refused to light a fire for fear of any smoke rising up and giving away his location. He also avoided walking in the snow to avoid leaving any footprints. One Mainer interviewed in Lena Friedrich's 27 documentary, The Hermit, the true legend of the North Pond Hermit, told filmmakers that he once saw footprints in the snow across a road. Based on the impressions of the shoes, the resident determined that they had been made in reverse, meaning the hermit stepped backwards to throw other people off his trail. Still, Chris would try not to leave the camp from November to March to avoid leaving any footprints. Burglaries would ramp up in October and November as Chris was stocking up for the long weeks alone in the icy cold temperatures. 
Yeah, he would not uh, step on grass or twigs or break anything. He would jump from like rock to rock to try to avoid any type of footprints or anything. Gosh, that's so exhausting. I know. I it's, mean, to me, I guess yeah. to him, maybe it was his form of relief and, and it would mm-hmm. have been exhausting to think of a, of a different outcome. To just traipse through it. But mm-hmm. the guy that, yeah, they interviewed in this said, you know, I can tell footprints and tracks. I'm a hunter. A lot of, I mean, everybody in this area is real outdoorsy and everything mm-hmm. and said, I told my kids, this is the hermit. You can tell the hermit's been here. Cause he said he, he was explaining how the pressure of the foot is supposed to go one way versus the other. But he said that the kids go, are we going to try to find him? And he goes, Nope, we're going to leave him alone. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, I mean, usually those footprints, or seen in one set of footprints seen in sand, but occasionally you see him in <laughs> snow too. And that was when the hermit carried you. <laughs> Chris created his campsite behind a row of boulders, which offered him privacy from anyone who could manage to wrangle themselves through the forest. He used spray paint to camouflage items so they would blend into the natural surroundings. Chris was so successful at hiding his location that you could be standing as close as 100 yards to it and wouldn't know it was there. In an interview with National Geographic, Finkel described Chris's campsite as, This magical room carved out in the middle of the forest, hidden by a stone hinge of boulders with a perfectly flat floor, thanks to National Geographic magazines. Indeed, Chris used Nat Geo and People magazines he stole from various camps to form brick-like objects he then packed under the dirt floor to make it nice and level. Again, shit I would never think about. That right? he would... It would. It was like dug about a foot or two deep. That's with, hard to do. Yes, it's a lot of work. But you know what? You ain't got none but time. Yeah, and a bunch of magazines. So, what, if the lo- watching alone has taught me anything, what else are you gonna do out there? <laughs> it's Except true. Think about your life, and on that show, they're all thinking about how much they miss their family. I don't think that's what he was thinking about. But yeah, all you have to do is nothing. I mean, it's you're doing stuff, but it's it's all on your own time. You know yeah. what I mean? You get, If you want to make your house, spruce it up. And that's what he grew up doing. He True. was real handy. So he, you know, and they didn't grow up with a lot of money. So he was already kind of wired, like you were saying, to know how to do these things. And and like you said, like you were saying, he spray painted things. He would get tarpaulins, you know, stealing these big blue tarps. Well, he would steal spray paint so mm-hmm. that he could spray paint. So And he also made sure nothing shiny was visible because in case anyone was flying over, he mm-hmm. didn't want any airplanes or helicopters or anything to be able to see, like, what's that shiny object in the woods? So it was very well thought out. He would bury a lot of stuff, like all the trash cans he stole, like metal trash cans, he would spray paint all those. I mean, everything was done with the purpose of not being found out. Yeah. But it was very well, this whole... I mean, this was basically a house in the woods because he had a bathroom over off to the side. He had a clothes washing area. He had a shower area. He had a little kitchen, his little chair. I mean, it was set up. Mm-hmm. It was, a, it's very impressive. I mean, 25 years. That's true. You got a long time to set it up. <laughs> you got a long time to set it up. What's so interesting is he went to such lengths to avoid people and to avoid being found. Yet, because he admittedly was too lazy to just live off the land himself, Mm -hmm. he had to position himself in a place where he could access other people's cabins and steal from or he would die. Yeah. And he also was, I think the closest store was an hour's walk. Um, And he, but he never went. He said he he didn't want to talk to the people. I think when he was caught, he had 300 and something dollars on mm-hmm. him um, that was all kind of wet, mushy money that was just in his pockets, but that uh, he, and it was just money that he had found here and there. And I don't think he was, you know, it's not like he's trying to steal someone's identity, trying to steal their credit cards, their money. He stole a backpack once that had passports in it, but uh, the family, when they got back, they found their passport, their backpack was missing. They started freaking out. Well, they found the passports on a dresser. Like he dug through the pockets of something mm. to give back important valuables. But I think when there was watches or, you know, he would take things that he thought, okay, well, they may miss it, but it's not going to be devastating. Although you just don't know, you know, something, yeah. a shitty watch to one person was like, one of the guys said, oh, my grandpa gave me that watch, mm-hmm. you know, where it was a cheap watch, but it was an emotional, but anyway, but he would steal, you know, money. But it was not, it was like a backup. He said, okay, well, I always knew that that store was there if I had to, but I really don't think he ever would have gone. I don't think he would have gone to a store, Barring even if he had to. everyone giving up their cabins and the, the camp shutting down, I don't think he would have. Well, and I think once he learned that camp was there, it was 
easy pickings. Yeah, and so easy pickings. It, why mm-hmm. would you? But yeah, that's like you said, he could have farmed, but I don't think that that's really a farming area. And if you're like, well, I like Maine and it says nothing can grow here. It'll die in the winter. Fuck it. I guess I'm, I don't know. His, his family 30 miles away had a whole freaking thing that they grew. Well, I mean, he, he would have to, to have it. good. I mean, he was in the Jersey though. You know, he's that's what the, I'm saying. He should have gone. If this is the life you want to live, by all means, live it. But you can't live it at the expense of others. True. So go to the land, uh, an isolated area. You know how to live off the land already. Your parents taught you how, and and do that. Just grow your own vegetables yeah, and all that yeah. and whatever. Yeah. Now, and uh, he did. They did say on his early days, uh, before he started stealing, he ate roadkill, including mm-hmm. a raw pigeon. Mm. And my God, why? <laughs> I imagine if you're starving, you're willing to do anything, but uh, the um, the things that could go wrong in your tum-tum Mm-mm. after eating a raw pigeon and then you're out in the woods dealing with that, I can't eat Chipotle without being within a ba- close to a bathroom within 15 minutes. There's no way I'm eating a raw <laughs> pigeon and surviving that. Oh, I can't imagine the texture and the ugh. Well, uh. not to mention like the bacteria and oh, yeah. like and diseases and stuff you could get from it. My taxidermy class lady was like, "Do not ever taxidermy roadkill. There are diseases in there that doctors have never even heard of." And I said, what? "I don't think that's true." But she was just saying, "Don't even taxidermy a roadkill." Wow. She didn't say anything about not putting it in your mouth. Yeah, she said that because a girl in the class had taxidermied a street cat she had found. But oh. Yeah, just for that, like practice? Oh yeah, she said she said I shouldn't have done it uh in my apartment. Uh Oh. Yeah. No, you should not. <laughs> you bad. shouldn't bring anything <laughs> dead in, into your apartment. No, I had a lot of questions, but I did not ask them because she was giving us enough info. But that was just don't even touch road ki- you know, a professional yeah. call a professional. Don't put a pigeon in your mouth. No. No, don't do that. To avoid freezing to death during the brutal Maine winters, Chris would wake up every night at 2.30 a.m. and pace around his camp to keep his blood flowing. On one particularly cold night, deep in the winter, Chris found himself low on supplies and food. He told author Mike Finkel that at that time, he saw a hooded figure, a sort of grim reaper, but female and wearing a hooded sweater. The Lady of the Woods, as Chris called her, asked Chris if he was going with her or staying. He decided to stay, but never forgot the encounter with the entity he called Death. What do you think that was? Uh, probably he, at first, Mike Finkel was like, do you think it was Mother Nature? And Chris said, well, you know, it probably, I was probably hallucinating. Yeah. Because he would fatten himself up in September, October, because he knew, in November, he Mm -hmm. knew he was going to lose a bunch of weight. And he said that he could, I mean, he would be so starving at times, like he felt his body eat, like consuming itself. Yeah, it does. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, that's why he was doing it, bear style. But uh, I think probably he was going through some type of hallucination Mm -hmm. and or the jazzy. Yeah, the lady in the woods in the (laughs) The jazzy. The lady of the jazzy, yeah. The lady of the jazzy. Yeah, on a loan, they have medics come out every so often to check on the contestants because they have to make sure they haven't lost a certain percentage of body weight and because... when you start to starve, your body starts to consume itself for calories. Mm-hmm. It's it's horrible, yeah. When bottled drinks were not at his disposal, Chris would melt snow for drinking water. He kept all the food he stole in plastic bins surrounded by mouse traps. He washed his clothes with laundry detergent he stole and then hung them up to dry. Worried that an unkempt appearance would raise questions if he ran into people, he often shaved and cut his hair. He even managed to rig an antenna 25 feet above ground to watch some shows on an old television he stole. Yeah, he said he watched TV like in the 90s and eventually it went out, but he could still get audio and that he would listen to it like an audio play. And one of his favorites was Seinfeld. He also said that he listened to Rush Limbaugh on a radio he stole. So you got a whole lot of weirds. You got Seinfeld. You got Rush Limbaugh. He told people when he was found that he knew who the Kardashians were. Yeah. So no matter who you are or where you are, you still know who the Kardashians Kim, are. Kim K's got that reach. She, you cannot. Yeah. She, uh, she'll she find you. 
But then he also said he didn't know what decade it was, which Dr. Dr. Todd Grande said he didn't buy that. <laughs> he did. Yeah, because because uh, they said that his last thing he remembers before going in the woods was Chernobyl and remembering hearing Ronald Reagan on the radio talking about the Chernobyl incident. So he said he knew who that was. And he said one of the favorite things that people would ask him, not favorite, but one of the most often things people would ask him would be, do you know who the president is? Do you know, And he would be like, yeah, I know who the president is. So that's my thing is you would know on the radio they go, it's the 2016 election. It's the, or not mm-hmm. 2016, you know, it's the 2000 election. You would hear them saying that, especially Rush Limbaugh. And he, I do appreciate right. he goes, said I listened to him, didn't say I agreed with him. <laughs> I imagine he, uh, yeah, being in May, I don't know, though it could have gone either way on that one. But also stealing all the magazines, like People magazines, you would know what was. There's a date on it. Yeah. Yeah, it has dates. Same with, he did have some, like, I can understand because I know people collect, like, um, big, a mass bunch of National Geographics from all decades. My dad did. My dad had, like, every, every um, one that had been put out. It was wow. wild. Yeah. I, well, that's what Chris Knight used as uh, the flooring in the house was like mm-hmm. bundles of those. Uh, and those are hardy. I was like, People Magazine's not as good as National Geographic no, for National floor Geographic purposes. No, National Geographic is sturdy. Yeah, they're It's a, hard, they're it's a hardier. Mm-hmm. People uh, is little, they're like us weekly. They're too flimsy. Too flimsy. And also books and stuff he didn't want to read. I guess he could use that as flooring. But yeah, I think, like you said, something like People Magazine and listening to the radio, there's no way he didn't know what decade mm-hmm. it was. He may have been being a little bit dramatic, but... Uh, I just love to think that he was listening to like, bam, I'm out, Jerry. (laughs) (laughs) And And he's going like, you got to see the baby. (laughs) (laughs) Maybe the dingo ate your baby. (laughs) Sinister Hood will be right back. Well, you were just talking about how you uh, and we have both talked about eating some burritos. will send us to the bathroom in a second. Mm, So fast. Yeah. I uh, Mexican. I love Mexican food. It's my favorite. But. It gives you some tummy problems. It wreaks havoc uh, down below. And you know what? Something really, truly gruesome. Nine out of ten Americans suffer from some type of gut issue. Mm. You're, list- you're talking to two of them right now. Gas, <laughs> bloating, diarrhea, acid <laughs> reflux. It's always something with my guts. Mm-hmm. Probiotics are supposed to be an easy way to support your gut and immune system. But according to research, 99.9% of the probiotics on the market – Die in your naturally harsh stomach acid before they get where they're needed. That's not the case with Just Thrive. Studies have proven that their proprietary formula arrives 100% alive in your gut, so it can do what it's designed to do, provide you with crucial immune and digestive support. It's vegan-friendly, gluten-free, dairy-free, histamine-free, and non-GMO, and safe for just about anyone at any age, including kids and moms-to-be. Plus, it's been loudly endorsed by some of the biggest health luminaries on the planet. So if you're looking to give your body the crucial immune and digestive support it needs so you can feel your absolute best, there's nothing like the award-winning Just Thrive Probiotic. Get 15% off when you go to JustThriveHealth.com and use code CREEPY at checkout. Public Goods is the one-stop shop for sustainable, high-quality, everyday essentials made from clean ingredients and an affordable price. Everything from coffee to toilet paper and shampoo to pet food. Public Goods is your new everything store, thoughtfully designed for the conscious consumer. Rather than buying from a bunch of single product brands, Public Goods members can buy all of their premium essentials in one place with one beautiful, streamlined aesthetic. I love the look of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's just, it's clean, it's clean lines, Glass bottles, which are more environmentally friendly. The candles, oh, smell so candle. good. That lavender vanilla candle is the best lavender vanilla candle I've ever had. I love I'll it so much. That. I never thought I'd look at my dental floss and go, "Yeah, hey, some classy dental right? floss." Right, <laughs> and it's not expensive. And mm-hmm. same with my dish soap. Like, yeah, look at that you're like, I don't need to put soap. this dish soap under the the kitchen cabinet. I'm gonna leave it out for everybody to see because it's fancy. I want people to know I look nice. And also, they use a membership model to keep costs low and pass on even more savings to their consumers. Best of all, you can make your first public goods purchase with no obligation. We have worked out an awesome deal. Receive $15 off your first public goods order with no minimum purchase. That's right. They are so confident that you'll absolutely love their products and come back again and again. They're giving you $15 to spend on your first purchase. You have nothing to lose. Just go to publicgoods.com slash creepy. Or use code CREEPY at checkout. That's P-U-B-L-I-C-G-O-O-D-S dot com forward slash creepy to receive $15 off your first order. 
Element is a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything you need and nothing you don't. That means lots of salt with no sugar. It contains science-backed electrolyte ratio, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, and 60 milligrams of magnesium with none of the junk, no sugar, no coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, no BS. Element is formulated to help anyone with their electrolyte needs and is perfectly suited to folks following a keto, low-carb, or paleo diet. When you sweat, you lose sodium. When sodium isn't replaced, it's common to experience muscle cramps and fatigue. Uh, Not as much anymore, but in my high-volume running days, uh, I once ran the 10-mile loop around White Rock Lake, and then afterwards, I didn't drink Element. I drank orange soda, Mm. and that wrecked my body. I got the worst leg cramps of my life. It was a nightmare. So now I uh, make sure I keep myself electrolyted. You got lit. I got to stay electrolyt with Element. (laughs) Element is so sure that you will love their product and come back for more. They are offering you a free Element sample pack. That's eight single-serving packets for free. Just cover the cost of shipping, $5 for U.S. customers. Get yours at drinkelement.com slash creepy. This deal is not available on their regular website. You must go to D-R-I-N-K-L-M-N-T dot com slash creepy. Upon announcing the arrest of 47-year-old Christopher Thomas Knight, Terry Hughes told the Banger Daily News, I've been involved in this investigation for quite a few years, and I'm glad to put it to an end. We finally solved the mystery of the Rome-Smithfield area that's been going on for generations. Hopefully, this brings some comfort to some people who own camps around the lake. I'm glad to be a part of it. A fog lifted off the residents of Kennebec County after the North Pond Hermit's reign ended. They were able to go back to the days of unlocked doors and windows, restful nights of sleep, and leaving their cabins each winter without worry. So what you're saying is there's room for a new hermit. <laughs> a new hermit's coming in. Yeah, don't announce to people that you're doing that. <laughs> That's just, you're opening yourself up to another hermit. We're getting loose, people. <laughs> Open your doors. In October of 2013, Chris Knight pleaded guilty to 13 counts of burglary. He was sentenced to seven months in jail, ordered to pay $2,000 in restitution, and had to complete a program for people with mental health and substance abuse disorders. He served his sentence in the Kennebec County Jail in Augusta, Maine. While in jail, he was diagnosed as having autism spectrum disorder. On November 4, 2013, he was finally released and moved in with his mother. His brother, who owned a scrap metal business, gave him a job, allowing him to fulfill his probation requirement. Yeah, he waited in jail so long that by the time they finally sentenced him, they pretty much let him out almost immediately with time served because he had been in there waiting. But his interactions with people in jail he said he at first he tried he's like okay i'm gonna go talk to people but then he said he would get feel weird he said he he goes i'm a square peg you know he just said he felt so strange having panic attacks and Mm -hmm. just out of your element yeah yeah i mean you go from he said in 27 years he claimed the only human interaction he had was he came upon another hiker one day and they said Hi to each other. Although a later report came out after he had been arrested and everything that he talked to some fishermen at one point who he said, look, I'm just trying to be left alone. And they were like, we get it. We're not going to give you up to anybody or tell anybody where you are. But even if those are the only two times you've spoken to someone in 27 years, to then be in a jail environment where you have no privacy. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. That is like learning to swim in the depths of the ocean. Yeah, that's uh, it, and I imagine whatever he I mean, he said that they said he completed the substance use disorder uh, program easily because he said he's never touched anything his whole life. He's like, right. I just have to get drug tested for no reason. But that that he completed all of his therapy with flying colors. But I imagine whatever he had going on, whether he had anxiety or that that's going to be extremely triggered by being Mm -hmm. not only sleeping under the same roof, but having to sleep with somebody else. And he told, you know, when he, he makes this connection and starts to talk about what's going on that he said, I I can't sleep. There's a person Mm -hmm. in the room with me. How am I supposed to go to sleep? There's somebody standing right there, laying right there. So you feel, yeah. Yeah. You feel vulnerable. And I mean, it's, it would be very scary. Oh yeah. I mean, and he owed restitution and they said, you know, he, they they only charged him $2,000 in restitution. Which is so little for what, (laughs) 40. He stole. I mean, he probably stole 
a half a million dollars worth of stuff. I mean, easily forty burglaries a year. Like they said, it was they calculated it was one thousand and eighty burglaries. They think is how many he committed. So why so little in restitutions? I think whenever you look at it and you go, uh, in the aggregate, it's a lot, but it wasn't you know fruitcake fraud style where he stole seventeen right. million dollars. You know, and it was in peanut butter jars and tuna fish. You know, yeah. Um, and they, but they did say when they arrested him, they go, okay, well, we're going to have to confiscate everything on you that's stolen. Tell us what's yours. And he said, head to toe, everything is stolen. I mean, Except had, his eyeglasses. Yeah. His glasses were the same. And he said he tried on various pairs of glasses throughout the years and mm-hmm. could never find some that fit or, you know, that uh, had his prescription, but that he wore like, and they also asked, Hey, you know, you saw that picture of yourself in the camp when they printed out the, the still from the surveillance footage, he goes, I didn't know who that was. I don't know what I look like. I don't look in a mirror. Yeah. So he's That's like, I don't know. It was point. a picture of a guy. <laughs> and Wouldn't he would you not assume, have. though? Oh, well, that's weird. And he doesn't have a concept of what surveillance footage would look like because if you went in in 86, you barely saw a TV for only a couple of years. You wouldn't really know what a, you know, surveillance camera would look like. And I think you probably would understand that technology caught up that to you that they would be able to film you. Mm. Yeah, that's bizarre. A lot of people thought he should have gotten a lot more than seven mm-hmm. months, but even the prosecution was like, it would be inhumane to put him in jail it, with being how he is. Yeah, it's like torture. <laughs> You're yeah. torturing him. Yeah, and I mean, in yes, he stole from people and he caused a lot of people trauma. In... On the scale of, like, how harmful did he do it, it, it's pretty low. So, you know, I mean, should he have gotten more time? Should he have owed more money? I mean, he has nothing. So where's mm-hmm. that money going to come from? Yeah. I think his brother, and then he lived with his mom for a while, and then I think his brother let him stay because um, in the book it said he was paid in room and board, which was sufficient to fulfill the probation requirement. And his brother had him disassembling car engines for the scrap mm-hmm. metal company. So it wasn't like he's out, you know, well, I'm going to go back to my job as a stockbroker. You know, he's working for literally zero dollars just right. for enough to to eat. And, st- uh, and that's all he, he wanted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned earlier his family was very surprised that he was still alive. Imagine you think your son is dead. Yeah. And has been for 27 years. And then you get a call that he's just been living in the wilderness 30 miles away and hasn't yeah. reached out to you once. Not one time. Well, and um, they also were saying that he didn't want the authorities to contact his family because he was being arrested and being charged with theft. And that he said that that's extremely embarrassing in his family. His parents would say, we never raised you to be a thief. Yeah. And so he didn't want them. He said at first, please don't contact them. But then, you know, when they say, okay, we're going to release you, who's going to come pick you up? You got to call. And he fam. doesn't even know his dad died. Yeah. For I mean, all he learns. knows, everyone in his family's dead, you know, mm-hmm. what a call to get. In 2017, Mike Finkel, a journalist, heard about Chris's story and reached out to him. The pair began a regular correspondence that morphed into in-person meetings. Finkel has been the only journalist that Chris has spoken to on the record. The book Stranger in the Woods was released in 2017 and details Chris Knight's 27-year walkabout in the Maine forest. Uh, Mike Finkel just got really obsessed with the story, and he's the one that he got fired from the New York Times for journalistic inappropriate behavior he like created a composite character and then a serial killer stole his identity and then he wrote it into that book a uh, true story that became the movie with james franco and jonah hill and so because he, life I, it's been wild so when he wrote out he wrote to chris knight and just kind of said hey i know you and you know chris knight's like i don't want to talk to anybody my reputation's been ruined and mike finkel's like well know how you feel let me right. tell you about my life and then he told him that and he said he thinks opening up like about that and he said it was a stupid thing i shouldn't have done it but at the time i thought it was right that he thinks that chris knight kind of related to that um but my favorite is when chris chris knight's like what did you name your kids and he, i can't remember exactly oh it's beckett it's not even a wild name so he named his kid Beckett and he told Chris Knight oh yeah one of my kids name is Beckett and Chris Knight's like why'd you have to go and name him something like that kid's gonna be mad when he grows up <laughs> it was like, he was very funny in his book Finkel writes you could take virtually all the hermits in history and divide them into three groups 
protesters, pilgrims, and pursuers. Chris told Finkel he had no interest in the Bible and was not religious, nor was he taking a stand against anything going on in the world. Chris also didn't consider himself a pursuer, one that isolates himself for artistic, scientific, or personal exploration purposes, like Albert Einstein or Henry David Thoreau. Finkel told National Geographic, His solitude, though he was a thief, was almost more rigid and locked away than anyone I could find in human history. Uh, he also hated Henry David Thoreau and thought that he was a he pussy. He thought he and, was, yeah. He, was like, like, he lived Thoreau's there for dilettante. two years and his mom did his laundry. He, 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 didn't, <laughs> his mom he was did his not laundry. a hermit. <laughs> he cheated. He had a we dinner party with like 20 people. Hermit. What's that? Henry David Thoreau had a dinner party with like 20 people. And Chris Knight's like, hermits don't have dinner parties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's not something we do. That's not our handbook, the hermit handbook. While the book frames Chris as somewhat of a hero, an everyman who was able to live the dream of independence and freedom, those who lived in fear of the hermit had a decidedly different take on the 27 years he spent breaking into people's homes. Residents of the area interviewed by filmmaker Lena Friedrich had varying opinions. One resident was asked what questions he had for Chris Knight. He responded, Where are my shoes? Harvey Chesley, the facilities manager of Pine Tree Camp, told the Banger Daily News, he used this as his local Walmart. The frustration was that we couldn't leave anything at the camp because it was open game to him. And like some people, they named a sandwich after him at the local deli. They wrote songs about him. So I think some people saw it as a quirky, fun thing. And I think they romanticized people, it. Yeah, yeah. And also like it's an area where independence is really so they, they mentioned that they don't think they said, well, this wouldn't happen in Texas or this wouldn't happen in another state like where it's like, get off my land, stay off my property that it was kind of like. Hey, if you need it, take it. You know, we're all trying to make our way out here in Maine. That it, people, like you said, people started hanging shit on doorknobs. So some people were mad about it, and I think it was kind of a split community. When his camp was deconstructed by the authorities, they took all of the stuff there and took it to the police station, and they told you know all of the residents, you can come down here and you can tell us what he took. And we will go back and see if we can find it and bring it to you. And that a lot of people went down there and they didn't even want it back. They just mm -hmm. kind of wanted to know. You yeah. know, and one guy was like, I just wanted to go look for fun. Like, I had no interest in getting my coffee mugs back. But it was just kind of like I was a part of this whole thing. So, yeah, I'm sure there were some people that were legit pissed. But others, it was more of a nuisance. Or like cool, like the guy that he stole the pants from, the pants he was wearing when he got arrested. The guy yeah. had reported those missing and was like, those are my jeans. You know, <laughs> you're like, you hey. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a story that you now have to tell people about how you kind of had a, a part in this. Hermit got arrested and wearing my pants. Mm -hmm. For his part, Chris saw himself as a villain, though one not meaning too much harm. He told Finkel, I stole. I was a thief. I repeatedly stole over many years. I knew it was wrong. Knew it was wrong. Felt guilty about it every time, yet continued to do it. Senior year of high school, Chris had taken hunter safety and outdoor skills, a regular course for students in Maine public schools. The teacher for this class, Bruce Hillman, told Finkel, Something that keeps replaying in my mind. I told every kid that if you're in a survival situation, life or death, and you came upon a camp, it's okay to break in. This is accepted in Maine. I have a camp too, and I always leave dry goods behind just in case others need it. I was thinking of a survival situation lasting two or three days, not 20 years. Chris, it seems, took this permission to the extreme. After his jail stint, Chris was not doing well. He abided by all the terms of his release while working at the junkyard owned by his brother. But emotionally, Chris told Finkel he struggled with making connections. At one point, he confessed to the author, I'm going to go walk with the Lady of the Woods. Chris even had a plan. Wander into the frigid Maine wilderness, lie down, and freeze to death. Chris said, It's the only thing that'll make me free. Something's gotta give, or something's gonna break. In summer of 2014, a few months after his release, Chris told Finkel that in six months' time, he planned to do it. When a worried Finkel tried to follow up with Chris about his plans later, Chris asked the author never to come back. For now and then hence. As for not wanting to be known... Unfortunately, even without Finkel's book, Chris didn't get his wish. His legend persisted in the Kennebec County area for 27 years. Now, after his capture, his story has captivated millions of people around the world. 
His words have been immortalized in Finkel's book, and soon, even more audiences will know Chris Knight's name. Sergeant Hughes told an audience during a presentation about The Hermit, the book has been optioned to be made into a feature film. For many, the question of was Chris Knight a hero or villain still lingers. One camp staunchly believes he is a criminal and a fraud, and only made it as long as he did by stealing from others. The irony that Chris claimed he wanted to isolate from society, yet was dependent upon that very society, and benefited from the hard work of others, is not lost on this group. Others view him as a true outdoorsman, who successfully managed to survive for 27 years in some of the most unforgiving wilderness in the U.S. Echoing these sentiments, Finkel told National Geographic, Chris Knight left because there was no good spot for him in this world. If you don't fit in and you're a murderer, they put you in jail. When you don't fit in because of mental problems, there are other facilities for you. This is a guy who's extremely bright and but just did not fit in. People said, can't we just give him a little bit of land and a few bags of groceries and let him live peacefully? I think so, but I think you have to also do it for yourself. You can't be completely dependent on others. Yeah, I think that's that's kind of the key here of, like you said, the irony is you say, I'm an island, I don't need anybody else, except for I will take those lands and slacks. Except for I would have frozen and starved to death had it not been for all of these other people that I don't want to interact with, but I'm willing to take their things. Yeah, and like the teacher said, Mainers are accommodating people of mm-hmm. you are freezing to death, come inside. You are hungry, here is food, but not for 30 years. Yeah, that's and a long time. It's a bit selfish to go. Yeah. And like he said, he's like, he said before he would go and like burgle a place that he was sweating, his heart was racing, he was panicking because he knew he shouldn't do it, but also it's that or die, but it's like, or walk back to your fucking parents' house. Yeah, and that's where it gets interesting and, and sad and complicated is, you know, is there something where he, like, just can't go back to his parents' house? He can't go to that store because he's so afraid of human interaction? Is it just because he just really doesn't want to? Mm-hmm. So it's hard to know, like, exactly how I feel because I don't have all the answers. And and he's, for his part, been fairly closed off except for his conversations with Mike Finkel. Uh, when he was initially caught, though, there was a group of people that started sending money to him to basically say, when you get out, here's money, you know, buy whatever you need. But the because he was in jail at the time, the jail confiscated that and put it towards his restitution mm. um, and towards the victims. But this is one of those things because he he's, like, disconnected, but... I wonder if, you know, he said, fund the hermit. Like, if I will put up a, it's like. A GoFundMe. A GoFundMe of the hermit or something. I think people would donate to it. Yeah, definitely. He would, I don't have to do some things. He probably didn't want you to get the money. Like, open a bank account and stuff like that. Oh, I thought he was going to have to, like, show foot pics or something. Oh, or that, yeah. Show show his camp, but. Hermit foot. Yeah, I mean, you get a TikTok for him. He's banking. Dunzo. You know, but, I mean, that's. It's in the Hermit Hype House. (laughs) Hermit Hype House. That's not what he wants, but. Yeah. It's this dichotomy of, I don't want anything to do with people, but I need people in order to survive. I mean, we all do. And yeah. also, like, I don't want to do anything for money. Well, none of us do. <laughs> right? Don't we all wish that our neighbors would just bring us quiches and we never had to go <sighs> to the store and do anything? Magic. Right? But, yeah, that's not that's not how it works. I wonder maybe if he had given something in return. Like, I don't, like made them something? little things or I, done something. Like painted the house? <laughs> Yeah, like, and I'm not saying, like, having to do it face-to-face with the people, yeah. but just something so it was more of a, a give-and-take relationship Barter. instead of just one-sided, yeah. Over the past two years, we've all had to learn to adjust to a socially distanced life. Working from home, birthday parties over Zoom, and virtual classrooms have become a way of life. For many, the forced isolation has led to depression, anxiety, loneliness, and boredom. For others, the changes haven't had as much of a negative impact. Some have even been surprised at how they have thrived with less human contact. For those that have always longed for a life of solitude, the past two years, in many ways, have been a welcomed relief. 27 years alone would leave most of us starved for human interaction. However, 
Finkel proposes in his book that with all the sadness and horrors in the world, perhaps Chris had the right idea. Maybe the operative question isn't why Chris left society, but why the rest of us don't. So what do we think? I like a good moral gray area question where, Mm -hmm. you know, you ask, you know, is it stealing if you need it? Like, would you, what is it on the office and they're doing, let's get ethical. And he's like, would you steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family? What if the question, you know, what if the rest of that question is the family starving because of your own choices that you've made? Yeah. You know, I think he's that's not like, where it gets gray. Oopsie, I'm in the woods and my car ran out of gas. Oh, sorry, I had to siphon the gas out of your car so I could get home. That's one thing. But I chose to do this for th- 27 years and I chose to steal from you. Then at that point, to me, it's not some amazing feat. It would, like you said, it would be an amazing feat if you said, oh, this person created, they grew potatoes and whatever else on their land. They never had to talk to anybody because they were so self sufficient. That's one thing. But in this case, you'd be stealing peanut butter crackers from, you know, kids living with disabilities mm-hmm. at a summer camp where they're supposed to go and have a good time and their shit keeps going missing. Yeah. That's when it's, to me, I've, you know, team Sergeant Hughes and team. Uh, Diane Vance that they said this has to stop we can't live like this anymore unless the community said okay like a little free library where they go like we're going to do a little hermit pantry Mm -hmm. where we all agree we're going to put stuff in that's fine if everybody agrees to it and there's a mutual aid situation going on but you can't I mean I guess if he thought well they would have boarded their doors up if they didn't want me to break in but you know you can't say they did a lot of the times it's like I gotta pry it off again some People shouldn't have to live like that, you know, I mean, I mean in constant window, fear. Yeah, if a window is closed, it's because they don't want you to come yes, into it. Like, yeah, and even yeah. if the window is open, they don't want you to come into and it. And so. they would leave things for him to take, and he wouldn't take that and instead break in. So they, I think they were trying to help him mm-hmm. in a lot of ways and be compassionate. But for whatever reason, he chose to keep doing what he, how he was doing it. Yeah, and like you said, if there's a rest of the story where he was just could not bring himself to speak to someone or could not bring himself and it was a compulsion that may mitigate the, you know, the intention that he had of that, well, he wasn't really just a selfish person. He just was so uh, it so abhorred the idea of interacting with people to the point that it was some type of disorder or something. Yeah, then that's paralyzing. A little, yeah, it was paralyzing. That's a little bit more forgiving. But also, you you can't, we got rules, man. We're yeah. living in a society of rules, Donnie. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, um, 27 years is a long time to continue just being like, well, that's fine. Because yeah. like you, at some point it just becomes, and maybe from the beginning it is selfish. Yeah. Like I said, unless you have people that say, we're going to set out this uh, plastic bucket with mouse traps outside so that, you know, the mm-hmm. animals don't get in it. But it's like, it's the hermit donations. Like, we're going to put pants in there. We know you're a size 38. We know that you like uh, peanut butter. You like candy. You don't like tuna fish, whatever. Here you go. Mm-hmm. But I think if it's like, this is my house, this is my stuff. And I get it if you're like, Again, you're stranded, your car broke down, you're lost. Like his teacher said, if you need something, we're here to help. But at some point, it's the pennies in the, the yeah. cup. And you're pennies taking for t- everyone. <laughs> it's pennies for everyone from the, the dying children. No, no, the pennies that, that everybody can take. Yeah. You can't just take all those pennies because then that's the stealing. Yeah. It's- and then there's no pennies for anybody else. But no. then it's, yeah, it's, it's, no, it's no longer a need. It's just mm-hmm. your way of life. And your way of life is... I'm admittedly too lazy to live off the land Mm -hmm. and I'm not going to go buy stuff for myself. So I'm just going to steal from people. I mean, that's, that's against the law. Yeah. And, and I think you're right. Like there is that just, when you put it that way of, Oh no, you burgled a thousand times. Mm -hmm. Not just, it's this magical story of like, isn't it amazing that it happened? And I'll give uh, Mike Finkel credit. I mean, like I said, I could not recommend this book enough. The audio book's only about six hours and it's so well written. But I will say, as much as he empathizes with Chris Knight and has kind of, you know, gets an affinity for him, he definitely covers that the impact that it had on the community, the impact it had on other people. And also, like you said, you just sort of, when you, take all the dressing and the trapping off of it, he actually just, like, stole stuff for mm-hmm. 27 years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then wasn't really, didn't really have to pay any of it back. Mm-mm. 
Yeah. I mean, some people, I think, got some stuff back, but I think it's more of 27 years of anxiety that these people endured and, like, just feeling like nothing is really yours and that somebody's lurking and that's that's unsettling that's a lot to deal with for almost three decades well and like kids writing essays for class like yeah. the hermit's gonna come in the night and get me and like uh terry he said you know we don't know luckily he was not violent right. but you don't know that and especially if you this is such a aberrant case because normally a burglar you know a peeping tom maybe will become a burglar and then a burglar maybe will assault someone and assaulting people maybe murder someone so you expect to see an escalation in this case it just happens that the guy was just trying to get his national geographic on like he was just trying to like read (laughs) or yeah there's a guy living in the woods and you're thinking it's a unibobber situation Mm -hmm. like rarely are you like oh no he's just a guy that really doesn't want human interaction and he's just living as much off the grid as he can and and still surviving. Yeah. And I think he, he really doesn't want it. Like Mike Finkel talks about, he said, you know, he contemplated buying him a tiny house or something. Mm -hmm. And then he thought, well, he just does not want me to interfere with And to his credit, you know, at the end when Chris Knight's like, fuck off into eternity, please stop talking to me because he was afraid he was going to take his own, like he was going to die by suicide. Mm -hmm. He was afraid that he said, he's going to go lay down in the woods and die. He, he, uh, Mike Finkel calls psychologists and says, is this imminent? Is this an imminent threat? And they go, well, no, he said like six months, maybe that doesn't really qualify. Um, but even with that worry, you know, he's like flew back out there, tried to interact with them. And when it was very clear, Hey, I don't, I literally don't want to be around you. I don't mm-hmm. want to be around anyone. He backed off. And so you say, okay, well, I wrote a book about you. There's going to be a movie about you. Do you want me to buy you a tiny home? And it's like, Nope, leave me alone. Is he still at his mom's? Uh, for for all that you can find out, he's still either with his mom or his brother. He's like with his family up in Maine. Yeah, because it kind of falls they, off. Like they what's did happened say, to him? I t- I'll take that back. I read an article that said he lives in a small apartment by himself. Which that's God help you, because living in apartments, you're gonna have hear people all around you. Oh, that's gosh, the opposite yeah. of the woods. Yeah. Um, ah, it's a like you said, it's a gray area, but. I think that um, you got to, you, if that's the life you want to live, you got to figure out how to do it on with either asking for help. Mm-hmm. And then, like you said, people are like, yes, we will help. Here's how we will do it. We have all agreed to this. We're all in agreement. Mm-hmm. Or you just don't do it. Because yeah. like Dr. Todd Grande said, that a lot of people really romanticize this and he thinks compared it to the young man that went into the Alaskan wilderness that into the wild is about that Chris, his name is also Chris. I can't remember his last name, but um, I'm going to call him Todd. Todd was like, that was totally (laughs) different because he lived off the land by himself. He didn't, he didn't steal from others. He didn't depend on others. In fact, he ended up, dying because he was living off the land and he ate some poisonous berries but you know i mean it's it's apples and oranges yeah those situations i think it because we do you know henry david throw throughout i mean there's a whole catalog of uh hermits throughout the centuries that you say oh they must be so wise or they must be doing it they must see something the rest of us don't see i mean in this case he just does not want to interact with people yeah, and that's he his like people. That's his prerogative. But I think it is a selfish thing because we all have to do shit we don't want to do. That's just yeah. life. There's yeah. a lot of shit I don't want to do every day and I have to do it. Mm-hmm. And you just do it. So to be like, I don't want to interact with people. I just want stuff that I don't have to pay for. I think that when you pull the fancy dress, the romanticizing of, oh, man, it was so cool how he survived in the woods and go, but he jacked my shit for 25 years. Right, yeah. It, it sort of, I think it takes some of the romantic part away from mm-hmm. it. I'll be anxious to see the movie. Um, yeah. Because be it is such a well-written book. Yeah. Well. You ready? I don't think um, Christopher Knight's going to be at these because it involves other people. I'm going to leave a seat in the front row reserved for him, though. <laughs> But we have some live shows, some live improv comedy shows coming up. One, this Friday at 8 p.m. at Dallas Comedy Club. We're back with the cult. We haven't performed together, this exact group of people, in two years now. We are our 
our Facebook chat is popping. Everybody's We're real ready. excited. We're ready. <laughs> raring. We are ready and raring to go. 8 p.m. Dallas Comedy Club. We have the link for tickets up on our site, so you can check that out there. And then, Heather. Yes. What's can happening you, on February 25th? Can you believe it? February 25th at 8 p.m., the cult's performing. But then, the same day, February 25th at 9 p.m., we are going to be in Hot Dish with another group of people. So if you're hanging out on February 25th, you're like, what am I supposed to do? What's going on? Double header, double prov. Also, double we should fist. mention double fish, double prov. When we perform with the cult, Gerald is opening for us. Gerald, oh, yeah. one of the best troops in the DFW, in, if not the world, let me just say. <laughs> David and Sonny Allison, Ray so Maddox, good. Lauren Oxford. You, you, they're my babies. I, used to, I coached them for over a year, so I'm very happy uh, to be in this time slot with them. It's going to be great. So that's January 28th at 8 p.m., February 25th at 8 p.m. and 9 p.m., both at Dallas Comedy Club. Go to Sinistera.com, and there's a button that says Live Shows, and I got your ticket links for you. And I just want to say the cult graphic is <laughs> Raymond, Nick, Tommy, <laughs> Christy, myself, and then Jade had another show, so she was late to our show. So I have, I'm going to use air quotes, Photoshop Jade into it. Just for the, just it's for great. that, check it out. <laughs> it's great. Well, we love providing Sinisterhood to you at no cost. So if you like what you hear, consider supporting the show by donating to our Patreon. We're a small operation, creating the show for you by researching, writing, recording, and producing it ourselves. Any amount is sincerely appreciated and helps offset the cost of making and hosting the show. As a thank you, you get some sweet perks like ad-free episodes, a Sinisterhood sticker, membership to our exclusive Patreon Facebook group, and the Ruling the Airwaves, and the Getting Into It tier, special shout-out on the show, monthly bonus mini-sode, and patron-exclusive video audio content, including Am I the Asshole, Relationship Advice, we got Judge Christie, Reddit, Wedit Drama, all kinds of fun stuff, and if you're in the Getting Into It tier, you get to pick... One episode we do on the main feed a month, this episode you're listening to right now was chosen by the wonderful people on the Getting Into It tier. So uh, if you want to tell us what to do, the Getting Into It tier, they also get <laughs> to doesn't? choose They get to choose our live stream too. So we are yep. every month at the mercy of our Getting Into It pals. So And they nail it every time. So every thank time. thank you. You also now have the fun perk of access to our Discord server, where you can connect with other fans in real time and discuss the latest in true crime, share personal ghost stories, or just post adorable pictures of your pets. We also hop on occasionally, and we host monthly Q&As on Crowdcast, where you can ask us all your burning questions. We had so much fun at this last one. It <laughs> it <laughs> devolved Descended. into pure chaos. It was wheels off. It was uh, the, the whole family ended up coming in. We had pedal on. Oh. It was it was wild. Yeah, we had all the children. My the goose. Petal, Paris, Tommy, it was everybody. All and the everyone dogs. Was, yeah, everybody was cracking up because we were just lifting the cameras up, walking it around the house. Um, it was madness, and it was it great. Was. And you can it watch great. Uh, the replay right now is available, the the archive, uh, to watch on demand. If you would and, like to see a very large pig just walking around my bedroom, <laughs> go check it out. Uh, my favorite is the comment that someone goes, that's a whole-ass pig. <laughs> it is. It was a whole-ass yep. pig. In it your is bedroom. a whole-ass pig. Mm -hmm. For our patrons not in the U.S., you now have the option to pay in pounds or euros. You can save the cost of the conversion fee. Annual memberships for all tiers are also now available. It's the best option because when you get this, you get a free month of membership. For more details on all of this and specific member tiers, visit SinisterHood.com and click Patreon on the top banner. And make sure you stick around after our sign-offs to hear your shout-out and our thank you corner. Yes, so many of you have been tagging us in pictures of you sporting your sweet Sinisterhood merch. Keep those pictures coming. I got a, uh, a selfie today from someone in a very cute, I got a lot of hot take shirt. Nice. It was like a blue, the the gray navy heather, and uh, had some matching purple eyeshadow. It was such a hot look. Uh, and if you want to get some cool Sinisterhood swag, like t-shirts, mugs, totes, stickers, and even clothes for your kiddos, visit Sinisterhood.com and click on shop on the top banner. The best thing you can do to help us grow is like, review, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcast. And please tell a friend who you think would like us to check us out. It means so much to us and really helps podcasts like us get more exposure. You can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Sinisterhood Pod. Like us on Facebook at Sinisterhood. Christy, where are you on the computer? I am on Twitter at Christy or GTFO and on Instagram at Christy M. Wallace. Heather? I am on 
Twitter at MCK versus the world and on Instagram at Heather versus the world. As always, the devil rules the airwaves. Keep it creepy. Hey, everybody. Thank you so much for supporting the show on Patreon. Here are your special Patreon shout outs. Rebecca Proctor. Brandy Abbott. Brianna Terranova. Abby Dealers. Jane. Emily Vivona. Eleanor Angel. Amy Pankhurst. Andrea Brownridge. Jonica Carney. Bruxy Flynn. Sarah Schlimm. Brianna. Daniel. Sarah Ham Glam. Alex Kresge. Miranda Hiller. Kinsey Ferguson. Alex Lepley. Lizzie Toralba. Daniel Lambert. Savannah Walters. Elizabeth Hurley. Kat. Marissa Bean. Elizabeth Hale. Molly Timmons. Sonia Hageman. Paige Fox. Heather Tate. Jamie Reese. Thank you guys so much for supporting the show. We couldn't do this without you. We sincerely appreciate it. We love you. We hope you pronounced your name correctly. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Keep it creepy. And here are our thank yous. Oh, I want to thank Jocelyn of Soul Shine and Moonbeams for sending us Florida water. Very excited about this. I learned Florida water. You can use it to cleanse your hands before tarot or meditation. Mm -hmm. Both things I do. And uh, Lucille Ball allegedly said, my Florida water is her final word. So I will be saying the same now. Ella picked it up and goes, what's this? I said, it's Florida water. She goes, I like the smell of it. What do you do with it? And I said, it cleanses negative energy. And she just looked at me and I said, we're going to wop the floors with it. (laughs) Spray the windows. Mm-hmm. It smells so good, though. Also, thank you so much for Callie for sending me the sweet birthday card. So very nice. And um, it was addressed to the Honorable Judge Christie. And I love that the post t- post uh, person, postal person now postal thinks worker. that a, a postal worker thinks that a judge lives here now. So yeah. that's awesome. <laughs> we appreciate you guys. Thank you. It's never necessary, but it's always appreciated when yes. you think of us for any reason. We just, we love it. Very much. Once again, stay safe, stay healthy, and keep it creepy. <laughs> Sin and-